Hello my friends and welcome back. It's Tuesday, so you survived Monday. Let's get this week going. And going, that, it, it is going, it's going really good. Because immediately when I made my yesterday's video, a few hours later, Hungary, Viktor Orban is like, all right, I'm going to ratify the Sweden accession into NATO. So I couldn't put it in my video. Orban is like, oh, Arthur just finished the video. Let's now ratify it so he cannot put it in. I don't know why I went French with Orban's accent. Well, the good news is, my friends, and congratulations to all of the free and democratic nations all around the world, because Sweden will be in NATO. All of the countries have ratified the accession, and officially it will take some paper pushing to get them in but they will get in and Baltic Sea will be NATO's internal sea. I am shining because you know what it's personal for me. Let's take the most robust and simple topic mortgage. I have a mortgage. I bought I mean mortgage for house. I bought an apartment for me and my fiance. I have to pay the back. Now that's a 30 year old project. 30 years you will pay this bill and you know this as Americans as Germans wherever you're from works the same way you pay it but you don't you don't have to worry in USA or in Germany that Russia will just destroy it with a missile in Estonia I do have to so I have all of these worries that you have that I'm miss gonna, I'm going to miss my payment I'm going to not make enough money some pipe will leak and the apartment will be destroyed but then like in Kiev there's this Russian missile threat now this Russian invasion and missile threat to my apartment, which I'm paying the mortgage to, was just lessened by a lot because Sweden is a great military power. They are a sea power, they're a land power, very good power in Northern Europe. Good politically, militarily, they have a lot of money, they have the Gotland Island in Baltic Sea. So for me, the most robust example of the mortgage even, and many other things, for me living in Estonia just got a lot safer. Thank you, Swedish people, for making this decision. Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, let me give you a very short historical outline. I'm no historian, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll just read the text so nobody can blame me. Uh, what the 19th century and the World War I, World War II, and the Cold War couldn't achieve, Putin achieved a uh, mere few years. After 200 years of Swedish neutrality, it is over. Sweden joins NATO, picks a side. And it's, it's my side, it's our side, it's the side of freedom and democracy, it's Ukrainian side. Woo! Skull! Cry me a NATO lake, Putin. <laughs> the memes are going to be priceless on this. Finland in NATO, talking about 1,000 kilometers of border with Russia that has almost no infrastructure on both sides, the Finnish and the Russian side though. So guarding this border is incredibly difficult. Well, for both sides, but it's mostly bad for Russia. Now, Sweden is in uh, NATO. Norway is in NATO. Denmark, Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Bada bim, bada boom, NATO internal lake. I'm going to go fishing there fe feeling extremely safe. I'm going to feel so safe, I'm going to faint. But don't take my word for it. What, I'm just an Estonian infantryman. I'm going to read you a thread by Jack Ditch that actually has more knowledge about this stuff. Why is it such a big deal that Sweden joined NATO? Sweden is the world's largest archipelago. archipelago. It has more than 267,000 islands. What the hell, Swedish people? Wow, with so many islands. What are you going to do with all of them? How do the Swedes define an island? Well, that's not important, really. Here's the context. The Nordic and the Baltic... The Nordic and the Baltic countries can't survive financially without keeping their pelagos and the inlets to the Baltic Sea open to maintain a commerce through the region. About 30% of Swedish foreign trade flows through Gothenburg port in the west. About 30% of Swedish foreign trade flows through Gothenburg port in the west. So one third of Swedish entire foreign trade and very important for the money situation of the country goes through the Baltic Sea of the Gothenburg port. NATO will get another capable navy that can deal in shallow waters less than 200 feet deep, dotted with gulfs, islands, narrow straits and critical infrastructure. The Baltic Sea region is dotted with oil rigs, gas rigs, underwater pipelines and underwater cables. Ever since Russia's full-scale in, full invasion of Ukraine, the Nordic countries have teamed up uh, to follow Russian vessels across the Baltic. And this is very interesting because before the full-scale invasion, Russia was the bad boy. They were following every... I would read it to you, sorry. From Norway, 
the Nordic countries track Russian ships back to St. Petersburg, following them with fixed and mobile sensors country by country. Now, I'm not going to read the rest to you, but you get the point. Before the full-scale invasion, everybody was afraid of Russia because the second army in the world and they're so big and powerful and the fear, fear has big eyes. Well, now we see Russian armies, it's a paper tiger. They have the mass, but they don't have the skills or the equipment. They just have the mass and it's very dangerous if you don't have the weapons, but NATO has the weapons. Now, Russian ships are being tracked on the Baltic Sea by... Americans, Norwegians, Swedish, Finnish, everybody. Well, not Estonians because we really don't have a weaponized navy. The thing is, if a Russian ship enters through the Danish Strait into the Baltic Sea, they're immediately tracked physically. They are tracked and followed onto the port of St. Petersburg. They don't have a chance to do anything unnoticed, even not the submarines. So Russia's Baltic fleet, pretty much strapped in St. Petersburg. As soon as war starts, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Estonia, these four countries have incredibly capable and modern anti-ship missiles. All it takes is target, push a button, bada bim, bada boom, no more Baltic Sea Fleet, but there is a huge Baltic Sea Submarine Fleet after that, if you know what I mean, wink wink. So for me, I know I'm oversimplifying things, I'm not naive or stupid, don't take this, oh it's so easy. No, there are a lot of threats, but for me as an Estonian, 30 years after re-independence in 1991, our situation is getting only worse and worse and worse, and now suddenly it got a lot better connecting to security and Russia. So I, I will allow myself a day of happiness and naivety. I'm, I'm aware of the situation though. Kaliningrad, Suwalki Gap, all of that stuff. There's a lot of B-roll for you, Adrian, today. I feel very talkative. Now, my friends, I'll jump to my Northern American tour in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, New York, Utah, Salt Lake City, everything. I want to focus today on Ottawa because there's a Russian embassy in the city of great city of Ottawa in Canada, and there are amazing, wonderful people protesting in front of that Russian embassy every day for the last two years of war. Every day. They have not skipped a single day. And I was honored with my team to join the protest. And we were protesting and harassing Russian diplomats. And if anybody watching from the police, no, we didn't touch them. We didn't do anything illegal. Canadian police was present. We respected all the laws. We were just letting them know very loudly that they are occupiers and they're not welcome in Ukraine. My friends, and they are so creative. I had a lot of fun because, you know, I'm, I'm traveling half other side of the world and I find people like that who are with the same mission as me. Ukrainian freedom and independence and the in, in, independence of democratic nations all across the world. We, we didn't need no time. We were immediately friends. Check this stuff out, my friends. It's pure humor. All right, my friends, I got my two prisoners here right now waiting for their hog trials. They're with me already. As you can see, the people agree. We are here with the protesters who have been here almost 700 days in front of the Russian embassy. Russia has a terrorist state. We have the two main terrorists right yeah. here. I'm taking them to hog. Slava Ukraine! Slava! And for you, it might be funny to, oh, they're just yelling something and We did all of that very loudly with speakers and everything in front of the Russian embassy, meaning all of Ottawa and Russian representatives who officially work there, diplomats and everybody. They work in that in the building. The building is not that soundproof, though. So they hear Slavo Ukrainian, oh, you lose each Ervonakali, and all of the songs. Fred was playing bagpipes, the Ukrainian anthem. They could not work for five minutes without seeing the Ukrainian flag, hearing Putin huilo, or hearing Slava Ukraini, they couldn't go out of the gates. So all across the world, my citizens, my democratic friends, you have the power to just let your politicians know what to do and let the Russian diplomats in your country know that they're representing a terrorist state. Also, thank you, Mo, from Ottawa for letting us stay in your house for three days. That was really nice of you. Thank you. Shout out to all the wonderful protesters from Ottawa. You're really fighting for freedom. My friends, let's go on with serious topics in Ukraine. Russian Ural trucks, uh, pickup trucks and vehicles, Kamas trucks. They're being armored slowly uh, and they're also being fitted with jammers because Ukrainian drones eat up so many Russian logistics trucks. In recent days, it has been 30 to 40 a day. And these are not these... Uh, 
NAFO trucks we give to Ukraine, these are big Kamaz trucks, big ones. One drone takes them out. They're so soft target, you can destroy them with a 9mm if you shoot them in the engine. That's true with every car, though. Before I show you the photos, I just want to give you the piece of information that I didn't also know. I, I googled it, I have to be honest here. I'm not an expert on this stuff. Jammers, drone jammers. They work by blasting electromagnetic noise at the radio frequencies that drones use to operate and emit information. Effectively, they drown out the conversation between a drone and its operator. This is usually either 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz, which are non-assigned public frequencies. Now let's see photos of it. First of all, you will see a Russian Kamaz truck with drone, anti-drone jammers. And we will fit every NAFO truck uh, we bring with jammers. We don't give them without because it's a suicide. You see, this is now fitted from the factory to the Russian trucks. And same to Ukrainians also. The volunteer trucks all have jammers and it's a must-have. But the issue with jammers is that jammers can be relatively cheap. 2,000, 3,000, maybe $5,000, but these only cover one frequency, maybe two, maybe a wider range. But the frequencies are very wide that the drones can use, and Russians switch every three months, also Ukrainians switch. Meaning, every three months you kind of would have to switch out all the jammers. If you don't do that, then you have to buy these very expensive jammers that can switch between frequencies. It's logistically really difficult. So... Jammers is a yes or no, it's, it's, a, it's complicated, that's the honest answer with it. I'll also show, show you a Ural truck with armor, and usually Russian armor looks so bad, but this one, I cannot say any bad things about it because it looks very good and professional. I, I hate to say it, but yes, this one, this one, I would do it the same way. Look at this cabin, armored, looking nice and beautiful, armored from the back. Now, of course, this doesn't save you from a direct explosion, but it saves you... I think this will save from 9mm, looking at the thickness of it, and if explosion far away, then the shrapnel won't destroy the people. Although, I don't know why Russians do it. I mean, they don't really care about the people, but I guess this crew wants to survive. Yeah. Hate to say it, but well done. Now, let's look at another Russian jammer. It's this one right here. They can take any shapes and forms. Usually they're quite small and you wouldn't even notice them, but they blast the waves about 200, 300 meters, maybe 500 meters out if they're more powerful. Usually it's two, 300 max. What it does, you see the kamikaze drones, they dive in and they start to lose signal for two reasons. First of all, they go low, lower than the mountains and the trees and the signal with the operator is being cut anyway by these natural barriers. And second of all, the jammers uh, frequencies kick in because they're so close. So you see grain coming in, you see for, uh, the feed being frozen and then you won't hit the target. So jammers are a lifeline, although they're so uh, difficult logistically to really put on because every three months your jammer is outdated because the enemy switches the frequency. It's complicated, but you need them. Now let's also look at Ukrainian jammers. Uh, I don't want to make the joke, but I have this dildo looking jammer right here. Um, it really blasts some frequencies into... I'm, I'm gonna start with the sexual jokes. Yeah, this one is a jammer. Uh, this one is a very common jammer, and this uh, pocket-looking thing on top of it is actually a bucket. It actually is. These are all made really fast, and, and these companies are all very new that make them, or they just started making them in mass. So this actually is uh, like a five-dollar pocket on top. You know, the jammer is inside, of course, not the bucket itself. Bucket uh, defends it from like rain and snow. But it's, it's small and it blasts the waves to 300 meters and uh, it's fixed frequency. These jammers cannot switch frequency. For that you need much more expensive and uh, a bigger jammer, which Ukrainians and Russians both have, but they're a little bit more complicated to make. My friends, now I want to give a shout out to my editor, Adrian. Adrian is right now in France, he usually lives in Estonia. He's a French guy living in Estonia, and guess what? He likes it. Well, I don't know what's wrong with him. He likes living in Estonia as a French guy. Usually nobody wants to come to Estonia. It's cold here, it's uh, dark, no sun. For most people it's depressing, but not for Adrian. So thank you, Adrian, for editing the videos. Thank you for um, doing what you do. I couldn't do what I do if you wouldn't do what you do, so... Keep doing what you do best, 
and uh, we all enjoy uh, the visuals and uh, branding assets for example were made by Adrian so he really does a lot for this channel so push a little comment for Adrian in the comments Thank you, Adrian. Now, my friends, I want to focus on uh, Ukrainian defenses. The situation on the front line, very robustly. I don't want to waste any of your time, so I'm going to say it very robustly and simply. Russia has the initiative and Ukraine is fully on the defense. That's, that's the reality. Ukraine does not conduct any large-scale offensive operations, only local counter-offenses, which are also part of a bigger defensive plan. Now, this, what you see here, is not a Russian Surovikin line, but it's a Ukrainian, in a lack of a better word, let's call it Ukrainian Surovikin line. It's an extensive, over 100 kilometers long Ukrainian defensive line in the east and in the Donbass region. As we can see, Dragon's Teeth, um, Bellatrina, or however you call this barbed wire, it's, it's not... Barb, it's actually with like these ra razor wire, blade wire, pelletrina, um, looks like this. Now, a little bit, I remember, and I, I'm quite honest about myself also, I used to make a lot of fun on Russian Surovikin line. And then the Ukrainian counteroffensive of 2023 happened, and then suddenly I saw that, yes, uh, although the Russian dragon's teeth were made really poorly and they started breaking apart when rain happened, I hope Ukrainian ones are better made, the thing is they still work. Static defenses in 2024 are still necessary, as Russia proved to us, unfortunately. If you have fire receptors, if you have enough ammunition, mortar rounds, artillery shells, you have good defensive positions, you have uh, anti-tank ditches, and dragon's teeth, you have air force. How is the enemy supposed to cross this? Especially without an air force, yes? And they proved that it, it works good. Now, Ukraine uses the same weapon against Russia now, because Russia uses mostly mass, human mass, and uh, infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. If you have enough ammunition and good firing sectors, then anti-tank ditch and minefields and dragon's teeth do a lot against this mass because it takes a little bit time perhaps minutes to clear these dragon's teeth and to fill up the ditch and to clear the mines it takes a bit more longer but even if it takes minutes these minutes count because it's fire raining down on you and this is what the russians did to ukrainians in 2023 so this line goes on for a long time and lack of footage of ukrainian line i will just show you Russian uh, Surovika line, well, the Ukrainian one looks pretty much the same. Uh, they also have an anti-tank ditch. They also have, after every one kilometer, they have a block post or a bunker with shooting directions of every direction on the high ground. So you couldn't really break through without fighting with these defensive positions, which are much like Avdivka's coke plant. So Russia, Russians will have a huge difficulty in breaking through that and that's Russians haven't even reached that line it's 10 kilometers in the depth of every any front line in eastern Ukraine so I, I don't see them preaching it ever never ever ever uh, the thing is nobody really has talked about it but Ukraine has built up this huge defensive line in the depth it has three lines ever after every three to four kilometers sometimes five there's another ditch there's more dragon's teeth, more minefields, more bunkers. So good luck with breaking through that with mass. Ain't gonna happen. Just to illustrate the hammer in the point even more. Yes, this is the um, Russian Surovikin line. It's summer 2023 and this is a remote controlled Ukrainian infantry fighting vehicle driving quite fast, I think full blast, into the ditch. This is here is a ditch. And you don't know unless you try. So they tried. Let's see what happens. If it's gonna cross it, it's and it fell into the ditch. This is how robust and simple it is. Anti-tank ditch. You can fill it up with two minutes. Yeah, if you have the equipment, boom, you fill it up, you go over. But that two minutes is enough for the artillery crews to load and shoot and the shells are raining down on you. That's what the Ukrainians are now defending on. That's what the Russians were defending on 2023. So I hate to admit it, but Dragon's Teeth, anti-tank ditches, static trench lines, defensive lines, bunkers on the front line. In this specific war, they serve a lot of purpose. They, have, they are very good defense. Now, my I just found this post. Uh, since recently, 24th of February was two years of Russia's full-scale invasion start from Ukraine. Just, this, Twitter just, X just uh, shared this post to me. It's a pro-Russian post, and I'll read the text just to illustrate how damn stupid it is. Exactly two years ago, our brave... It's pro-Russian. Our brave heroes, paratroopers, 
accomplish the feat that is now and forever included in textbooks. The soldiers made a throw in helicopters deep in behind enemy lines, straight to the gates of the enemy capital. The forces were not equal, but our soldiers were able to gain foothold at Hostomel airfield, organize defenses and hold out until reinforcements arrived for two days. And it says they're heroes. Now let's watch the video and while this is going. Now you can see the video of the actual operation behind when I'm speaking. But I've spoken to many soldiers in Kiev. Uh, actually Operator Starsky was one of the first ones to take this attack. To fight back to be at the Hostomel airfield. Because his actual office was at this airfield and it was destroyed. What really happened? Yes, these paratroopers landed in Hostomel, about 500 of them. What happened uh, at like, a few hours later? Ukrainian military leaders, commander, general in Kiev ordered the full bombardment of the entire airfield. So uh, Ukrainian military and army units didn't even reach the airfield. Who did reach there were the firefighters and the police, both of them armed. They started uh, securing the outer perimeter of the airfield while the 500 Russian elite, best of the best paratroopers, were inside uh, securing the positions. Now suddenly, Hell, hell starts firing down on them with mortars and artillery, everything. And the Russians are like, what? They're bombarding their own airfield. But we have Antonovs carrying in more paratroopers trying to land on this airfield. And in three hours, the entire runway was destroyed. So the uh, paratroopers up in there had to turn back. Number one, the main point of capturing Hostomel was failed. Because the paratroopers were supposed to land and take entire Kiev. This couldn't happen. Number two, these, what this Twitter user called heroes, and they achieved this impossible feat by next morning, 24 hours later, 12 actually even, they were all dead. They were hunted at night by Kievian police and uh, firefighters with weapons. They were bombarded with artillery and mortars. By next morning, they were all dead, every last one of them. So I don't know which kind of feat or heroism, well, they were brave. But which kind of uh, great success this Twitter user was telling about. But uh, since two years has passed from that day, it's a good throwback to analyze the huge failure that this operation was. And even the bigger failure that the coming huge massive nuclear convoy to Kiev. 100,000 troops stuck in a highway, three lanes of tanks stuck behind it. I don't see no success there. My friends, the French president... Emmanuel Macron initiated a security meeting, uh, an emergency meeting, because Ukraine is in a very dire situation. The defense is holding, but there's no way to attack uh, in any way, and there's a, an acute shortage of manpower and shells now. The situation is very similar to 2022, actually, and they just pulled out of a, of a village also. It's it's called the village of Lastochkina, and it's uh, near Avdivka, so Ukrainians are very slowly pulling back. We're now talking about like five, six square kilometers again, retreated to the Russians. French president invited the meeting. The point of this meeting was to step up support for Ukraine from Europe. Of course, United States representatives were present, but we know what the situation is in the US. And honestly, all messages outside of the US going into the US should be Thank you. That's it. Thank you. You're not the babysitter of Europe. You have your own problems. European leaders need to wake up. They need a bitch slap. Olaf Solz needs a bitch slap to the face. Wake up. It's our continent. It's our country. It's our freedom. Our languages and people cannot look for outside for defense. It's our responsibility. And I'm in, a, I'm in Estonia. I'm 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers from St. Petersburg. I can speak this. I can... I don't have to like be worried about, oh, this is not correct to say. I'm next to Russia. Europe needs to wake up. Now, I'm glad Yamalo and Macron called uh, this meeting because it's very necessary. Because Europe has failed in supporting Ukraine. They promised 1 million shells by March 2024. They have delivered 300,000, one third. About 50% of the entire aid uh, being given to Ukraine and promised is late. So only half arrives at the right time and the other half arrives later. How is Ukraine supposed to fight like that? They're fighting for all of Europe, but we are promising them, yes, we help you. And then only we send half of the stuff is like, eh, sorry, we don't have it. European leaders get in line. Just make a full circle, like Orban and Scholz all. Just make a circle. And each of you bitch slap the person to the right in the face, like, bam. 
that will wake you up. Now, of course, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland and Poland should not be in that circle because we all know we all act right now. Estonia has given one third of her entire military capability to Ukraine. Finland is sending a lot and they joined NATO and they have the biggest reserve army in Europe. They never had any illusions. Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, everybody. But Germany, Spain, France, Italy... What are you doing in those countries? Wake up. My friends, the moment has arrived. We all were anticipating it because I've said it so many times. I think you know what I'm talking about. Abrams tanks. Don't matter who makes the tanks, if Merkava, Abrams, T-90 or you, whatever, Korean K-2, each and every one of these tanks, modern tanks, old tanks, they will be destroyed with one, two or three small uh, kamikaze drones that are carrying RPG-7 rounds. This kamikaze drone costs $1,000. Don't matter how much the tank costs, they will be destroyed. Each and every one of them. So there's no superior Western tank. It's all the same iron and in, in front of a kamikaze drone, it's all gone. Why I'm saying this is we have a footage now of first uh, United States supplied Abrams tank being destroyed. Now, it wasn't destroyed by a um, kamikaze. In the end, what finished it off was a, a shoulder-fired RPG, if I'm not mistaken. But it was destroyed because it's a piece of metal, as is every last tank in the world. And for those who might have an illusion that Western tanks are somehow superior, yes, they have better sensors, they are faster, they have better ammunition, they have better survivability of the crew, which is very important, but they will still be destroyed by artillery and kamikaze drones. That's, that's the main point. This happens. And this is the first of 31 uh, Abrams tanks sent to Ukraine. My friends, now I will read you a thread which uh, illustrates Russian commanders' punishments to the troops to keep them in line. Because after the huge losses taken in Avdivka and the onslaught that followed, because for that week after Avdivka, Russia started pushing everywhere and took huge losses, including the Air Force. Losses were so high that Russian troops kind of refused to go and fight again. This sometimes happens. How Russian commanders usually fix it is they increase the punishments. I'll read you a thread analyzing the punishments in the Russian army. This comes from Chris O. Wiki, wonderful page in Twitter. Hellish conditions on the front line in Ukraine have reportedly led to an upsurge in extrajudicial punishments in the Russian army, with soldiers being hanged from... Uh, or tied to trees for days for, I cannot say this word, I can't even show it, please. They're forced to be, like, this comes from interviews with Russian troops over the past few months. Many have been fighting at the Ukrainian bridgehead at Krinki on the left bank of the Dnipro, which they describe as a scene of slaughter with 60 to 100 people dying every day on the Russian side. And that's only Krinki, one of like five to seven fronts where Russians are pushing. So... 1,000 KIA per day, it's very logical if you hear these soldiers saying that only one area takes 100 per day. It is hell there, says the Russian soldier. They're killing each other. The Ukrainians are killing each other. What? I think this is a translation mistake. The orders are stupid. Everyone understands that you can't succeed, but they send them to die anyway. He's talking about his own commanders. Group after group was sent to assault Krinki since November 2023, and almost no one came back. This task was set constantly. During the whole time, a single person, not a single person came back out of there. But they still sent and still sent people there. On February 20th, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu claimed that his forces had recaptured Krinki. However, Russian Marines fighting there had denied this. Uh, Verstka reports that 200 men died there on that day after Shoigu's announcement. So, I already reported this, but why was this so important? You, you see your commander of commanders, the top of the army, report to the dictator that this position right in front of you has been taken. But you are the soldier on the trench seeing that position. You know, 200 of your fellow countrymen men have died, your comrades sent to sleep with the fishes, and then you see this Shoigu doing the shenanigans. Of course, it reduces the morale so much. There's a situation in which the frontline Russian troops have established a brutal discipline regime while their commanders are absent in safe bunkers kilometers away. Notably, convict soldiers are going wild and treating mobilized men savagely. Yes, on the front lines, usually with the Russians right now, there are mixed convicts with regular men from Russia who just uh, signed up as volunteers who just want to make money. And these two don't go together. In Russian prisons, you get 
You get a, it's a different mindset. It's like, um, yeah, there are different rules to life. There are different ways of, of doing things, different ways to discipline people, different respect laws and all of that. And if that is translated onto the front, the convicts will take over. And that again results in low morale, uh, unnecessary deaths, a lot of alcohol and drugs, because the convicts will sell and they will make money out of all of that. So the situation is pretty dire for the Russians also. But again, don't take it as, oh, the situation is so bad for the Russians, they're going to collapse. No, their army is not going to collapse anywhere. Their economy is not going to collapse anytime soon. It's not that. It's just to illustrate. Both sides have huge issues right now. They have different issues. Russia doesn't have a shell shortage ever since North Korea started supplying them in Iran also. They had it before. Ukraine, on the other hand, has a huge shortage of manpower and shells. Different issues. My friends, thank you for coming back for the second time in this week. I really love making these videos for you. I do enjoy it so much. And since I'm fighting for my country and for Ukraine, I also feel that, like, I feel I'm accomplishing my mission to do this. So you're giving me an ability to do that. So thank you so much for giving me a purpose, for allowing me to have a good purpose. You're doing that. Please be back tomorrow and until my next video, which is tomorrow. Slava Ukraine and bye-bye.